Well, now we have uh, ample time for uh, questions. So I think what I'll do is to take uh, four questions and then let the uh, speakers respond to them. Um, there's uh, one person over there. Do we have somebody with the microphone? So there's somebody over here. Does somebody have their hand up over there? Oh, with Francois. Hello. They gave me the mic. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. Thanks. Um, this is uh, on the presentation by Arjun on uh, consumption and income inequality. Um, the first set of issues would be why the difference between consumption and income inequality? Is it taxation? Is it savings? Is it remittances? Is it credit? And so on and so forth. Just to explain that, that difference. But even more critically for me would be the issue about <clears throat> the utility of either of those categories for policy. Uh, which, which would be more useful for policy makers? Is it uh, income or uh, consumption or expenditure uh, in inequality? Uh, and then uh, lastly, the issue about uh, consumption and life expectancy. This is just to pose the question whether there is a certain level of consumption that might in fact be negative for life expectancy depending on what people consume. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Francois? <laughs> yes, thank you very much for the very nice uh, presentations. I would like to say a few words about uh, the two presentations on uh, uh, global uh, uh, inequality. Uh, the first thing that I, I was very uh, uh, pleased to see that uh, there was so much interest for uh, this issue of uh, global uh, inequality and uh, this uh, uh, suggests to me that uh, maybe it would be a good thing to uh, try to organize uh, some meeting where uh, people interested in that issue could uh, exchange views because there are many different uh, issues there and uh, we are very far from a complete agreement on uh, what is going on. And, uh, for example, today we had an example of uh, uh, a study which was based on uh, survey means versus a study which is based on GDP per capita. And we know that this has been one of the most uh, important uh, discussion uh, in, uh, in this area. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is a, a recent paper by Anand and uh, Siegel in uh, the Handbook of Income Distribution I was mentioning yesterday, uh, which is uh, uh, discussing that again, which is proposing a new uh, estimate of uh, global inequality. There are now uh, estimates, new estimates by Milanovic which go to uh, 2010. In a forthcoming book, I have uh, some estimates uh, which are also going until uh, 2010, and uh, I think it would be a good thing to uh, try to uh, make sure that uh, everybody is more or less on the same page, uh, and that when uh, we say uh, that inequality is going down uh, in the world, uh, there is a truly an agreement. So uh, really this is an invitation maybe to wider to uh, organize uh, such, uh, such, uh, such a meeting. Uh, a few, one uh, remark uh, only on uh, the presentation by, uh, by Wider, uh, which is on this uh, issue of the, f the fact that lately uh, it would seem that the within country inequality, when you decompose using the tile uh, number two, uh, is uh, going down. Uh, it seems to me that it is very much due to the fact that you are using uh, the tile number two. Uh, which is a mean logarithmic deviation. If you were using tile number one, 
which as a matter of fact is decomposable, unlike what was said in uh, one of the slides, then you would not find that uh, result, simply because in that case, countries are weighted by their income and not by their population. So China would uh, weigh much less uh, in that case than the United States. And uh, uh, the increase in inequality in the United States would definitely uh, uh, cancel the uh, drop in inequality in, uh, uh, in, in China. The last word about uh, David San presentation. Uh, I'm not sure about the way in which we have to interpret the result that uh, you present. Uh, I would tend to say that this result that Today, the progress in health is progressive, is a sign of inequality. Because what it mean? What does it mean? It means that in the progress in health, in the population in those countries, rich people were the first to benefit from this progress. And what you observe today, when you look at the last 10 years, is that the progress uh, is made in, uh, at, the, at the bottom of the distribution. The first people who benefited, for example, from a better education or from secondary education in those countries are people coming from rich households. And uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, the children in the other uh, households were not going to school. So when you look at the evolution over the last 10 years, of course, it is progressive. But the real issue is why was it okay that right at the beginning more health care was uh, uh, delivered to rich people than to poor people. This is, I believe, what those curves are showing. Thanks very much. Uh, is there another question? So, right here. Nora? <clears throat> yeah, I have a couple of questions. The first one um, is, I, I didn't get your name. I walked in when you were already speaking. My name is Rahul. Uh, yes. You presented an example about Mexico where you predicted the consumption shares, and that's a country, one of the few, that has both income and expenditure. So why didn't you, maybe you have done it, but why didn't you show, use a Mexican example to show how well you predict or not <laughs> the, the uh, consumption shares with your method? Because you can do it for Mexico for every year. They have consumption expenditure surveys since the 1980s up to 2012 now, so you could use that case for that purpose, and Brazil does too. And uh, David, I was uh, kind of puzzled <laughs> by something in one of the curves, I mean, it's a very, very pedestrian question, but you had uh, a negative growth in height for people that are rich in one of your curves, and how is that, I mean, it's, it's peculiar. Did you notice that in one of your uh, health incidence curves? Because it means that uh, they're shrinking. <laughs> and since they're the rich, I, I didn't understand why. <laughs> okay. And uh, one more. Um, here. Uh, this is for Miguel, and possibly for you it might have some implications for your work as well. On the decline in the between group component of the Gini coefficient, global between group component, it's probably susceptible of a rather simple arithmetical ex uh, explanation. Uh, not least because of China and India, which have very low bases of mean incomes and have registered very large rates of increase in uh, uh, per capita income. So it's inevitable then that. Uh, if you're starting from a low base and have and register high rates of growth, then a relative index of inequality will decline. And uh, uh, and this is also entirely compatible with absolute differences in means actually increasing. So the 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 tendency for inequality to decline might actually be reversed if you were to look at an absolute index of inequality or more reasonably a centrist measure. And in this context, I think I should uh, draw your attention to two recent pieces of work. One is a paper by Atkinson and Brandolini, in which they show very clearly that it is only relative indices of inequality which have displayed a secular decline uh, in the global distribution of income, unlike uh, centrist measures. And more recently, a paper which appeared in Economica by De Costa, De Kank, and, uh, and uh, uh, Osmonds, 
So I think this is an extremely important issue where the protocols of measurement themselves determine what kinds of trends you're getting. And with respect to the health uh, 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 trends uh, which you see, I think really it's, it, is, it should be regarded as being somewhat unremarkable that people at the very uh, bottom of the, of the income distribution should be registering large rates of increase, uh, simply because of the base effect. Uh, a given absolute increase will translate itself into a very large proportionate increase for those who are lower down the income distribution scale. That's not necessarily a case for celebration. It's what one should normally expect. When you don't see it happening, as in the case of growth incidence, uh, income growth incidence curves, uh, that is indeed bad news. Uh, but I don't know that what you call good news is necessarily good news. It's just unexceptional. It's unremarkable. But the other thing is really bad news. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Well, uh, we've got a good collection of uh, questions and uh, comments there. Rahul, uh, why don't you start? You've got uh, a um, number of questions. So thanks for the questions. Um, first, why consumption and income difference? Uh, consumption and income are quite different concepts. You'll find that consumption is, tends to be far less concentrated than income. Um, and uh, people tend to mix them, uh, but we wanted to keep them separate because the trends in inequality as well as the uh, levels of inequality are different. Like there's a recent paper um, in the U.S. which uh, looks at both consumption inequality and income inequality. It shows that consumption inequality hasn't changed much, but income inequality has uh, increased too much. So there might be uh, differences uh, in terms of uh, levels and patterns. So we want to keep the concepts different. Um, on the utility in policy, um, the, uh, the income, um, one can conclude by looking at consumption, uh, consumption uh, inequality that it's not changing much, uh, but um, income inequality might be changing a lot, which might uh, result in pol tax policy or other issues. So uh, they have different implications for policies. Um, on the part of consumption, um, consumption profile and negative uh, life expectancy, uh, that example was just an illustration of a, uh, how the database could be used for partial ordering or uh, any other uses. Um, it could be a negative correlation. I'm not very sure. Thank you. And um, one more question I forgot. Okay. The Mexico example for 1989, uh, which I show from consumption to income, um, again, that is just an illustration of uh, how uh, for, for, for in our database currently for 1989, we have uh, Mexico only has an income survey. So um, as in, from the data's, uh, data we have, uh, we might... Uh, uh, the more data we include, we might have both consumption and income. But this was a, just an example of showing uh, how um, uh, for other uh, countries also we convert the income into con uh, consumption or vice versa and how it would look at the various stages. Thank you. Well, um, I think I, we got more suggestions than questions, so I, we just want to thank for your suggestions. So, of course, we will look at the alternatives of looking at, for example, the TLT. Uh, thank you, Francois, and Sabu, so thank you for the references. We will take a look at this. Um, and uh, on the water meeting, perhaps, I don't know whether uh, Fing wants to say something, but, uh, yeah, I think it would be very interesting to see whether we can organize uh, a meeting on these issues. Yeah, thank you. Uh, David. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with the Nora's question since it's easiest. Uh, at two, two issues. One is, firstly, if you look at the tails of the distribution where you noted that in a couple cases, there are large standard errors at those tails, so those numbers that are minus 0 0.01 don't mean anything given at the at given the size of standard errors. Also, at the tails of the distributions, uh, we use a relatively narrow bandwidth in terms of estimating the regressions. We can use a broader bandwidth in those extremes uh, or those drops or in precipitous increases will disappear. We didn't do that. So anything, I shouldn't really say this, but anything in the top 5% or bottom 5%, you can kind of ignore for now. Um, but Again, that's kind of representing the large bandwidth. Um, no, well, you know, they could, but uh, not, not too quickly. Um, 
But of course, these aren't people, right? You know, it's an ordering of the distribution. Uh, so, so it is plausible. Um, so, um, let me go back to uh, what you think is unremarkable. I think there was something. It may be unremarkable. There was something clearly misunderstood, though. These are not proportional increases. These are absolute increases. So, if it, it is somewhat remarkable, given that they're absolute, I would argue, uh, but. It's certainly a different story if it was proportional. But just let me reiterate, all the improvements in health were absolute terms. Okay. Um, so um, then, um, Francois, I'm not quite sure how to respond to that. You say the bad news is that things were unequal, and the good news is that things are less unequal. I, I think that's right. I mean, it is maybe bad news that very poor countries 20 years ago were the poorest countries that the well-being, not only at, in, in income, but especially in areas like health or education, were uh, at, at that state were particularly poorly distributed. Um, but luckily that's history, and as history is evolving, things are unambiguously getting better, uh, and I think that's the, that's the main story. Uh, but let me also make a point about, and it somewhat relates to your point, even if you want to think about absolute increases. You, when Francois, when you said, well, that the rich people got better health care 20 years ago. Well, let's remember that 20 years ago, and even today, the rich people are the top 5% of these distributions. I mean, in many of the countries, particularly in Africa, 50, 65% of the children are malnourished. So the vast, you know, we're looking at these distributions. We can't look at these distributions like we do in, obviously, in France or the U.S. At least in terms of health, these kids are, have very high infant mortality rates. Up until the 75th, 80, uh, 75th or 80th percentiles, they have a very high probability of stunting. So even at the upper ends of these distribution, these kids are not in great shape, okay? So the... The increases, though, are concentrated amongst the worst off kids. But it's not like you have a whole bunch of kind of, you know, middle class kids whose health are, is also improving. Everybody, almost everybody in these populations is really at a very high health risk. Okay. Um, let, me, let me stop there. Oh, I, one, one thing. I didn't say anything about the first comment about life expectancy. So I was talking about two measures of health, just to be clear, infant mortality and heights of children. Um, you did ask, is there a level of consumption at which uh, life expectancy will be adversely affected? Uh, the short answer is not that I know of. There is no evidence in any country that uh, while there are changes in terms of the causes of disease as countries get wealthier, uh, on balance, despite you know the emergence of diabetes, chronic disease, and other things like that in sub-Saharan Africa or in East Asia, richer as countries get richer, their health does improve. Um, so I don't think that's really something we've got to worry about at this point, and I don't think it's something we really will have to worry about at any point in the future. So thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, well, let's uh, see if there are some more questions. Here. Two questions, one for Rahul. Um, can you give us a, a best estimated date as to when the, the data series will be available publicly? Uh, and for David, um, I feel slightly uneasy about your, your paper because one of the things you haven't mentioned, I think it's, it's admirable to look at this long uh, as long a time series as you can. But one of the things that's going on over this period that you haven't referred to is urbanization. And I think if you analyzed your data separately for rural children and urban children, you would come to very different conclusions. Because all of the, every study I've read over the last two years points out that the height um, figures for rural children because of a chronic underlying health condition in Asia, Latin America, and Africa, the height um, 
outcomes for children in rural areas are universally worse than in urban areas. So part of what is happening, I think, in your results is simply the degree of urbanization uh, that is going on over the time periods that, that you're examining. So I would urge you and Steve to uh, perhaps take a back up and, and take a look at this with what's going on with urban and rural children. I think you'd find uh, quite a different, uh, different picture. Okay, could you just pass the microphone across the aisle to uh, know this gentleman in front of you? Hi, uh, thanks. I've got a question for Raoul as well, actually. Something I'm, I'm really curious about is, uh, and I, I, apologies if I missed it, and I don't know if you, whether you've looked at it or not in your project, but um, so differences, let's say, by decile, decile shares um, of consumption versus income. Something I'm curious about is if there are any, um, uh, any trends, for example, across, especially, for example, across decades, let's say, you know, whether those, the sort of differences um, remain constant over time and also whether there are any spatial things or things related to level of development, level of GDP and so on. Okay, and uh, Finn? Th thanks a lot. I, I have a question for David, or f first an observation and, and, and a slight marketing stunt, and then on the other hand, um, a, a question. The first one is when you say all of that literature just looks at one fruit and then you, you sort of change it to the majority. I mean, you will find actually 20 uh, wider working papers emerging out of a growth and poverty project. That, that have, I mean, that has specifically tried to exactly say it's not just one fruit. Um, the, the question really is, it, it, it emerges out of conversation with a key central bank governor in Africa. He basically sort of says, I'm fed up with donors because we've been doing what they told us, focusing on public provision of social services. We've used massive amount of money, including aid, for that. We've seen substantial improvements in these indicators which you are referring to, not quite a substantial an improvement in uh, the income or consumption based, and then he sort of sits there scratching his head and he says, well, but the public provision um, of these services is part of government expenditure, which is not captured by the consumption based measures. So I was just sort of wondering, I, I mean, does that give any sort of uh, do you agree with that? Uh, is he right? Uh, and and, and what, I, I, is it explainable w because of this observation of, of, of co private consumption versus public provision? Is that what's looming in the background? Okay, let's uh, take some answers and then we'll have more questions. So uh, you had a few, Rahul? Um, on data availability, uh, as we, uh, as three of us uh, tend to say that we are still in our alpha version and not even the beta version, so we are not uh, very sure um, on exactly when, but uh, we plan to at least in the next year uh, give, uh, get out some data there. Um, the second uh, thing on decile shares and income shares by spatial distribution. Uh, so in the regressions, we try to add uh, both uh, regional dummies as well as uh, decade dummies and see, but um, it did not have much of an impact. But that is also because we have limited data where country years have both a consumption and income survey. So uh, it's not conclusive. Okay, and uh, David, you have a couple? So I, I am certain that um, you're correct in the sense that part of the story is part is in part the dramatic movement of populations from remote areas that are poorly served by public services, where markets are thin, where prices fluctuate, where access to food is limited, where there's greater vulnerability to famine and so forth to urban areas. So there's, there's no question in my mind that a large share of the health improvement uh, may be attributable to the structural change in the economy where people live and their access to services. So I think that's correct. Um, and it is correct that urban health indicators uh, are better than rural health indicators. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's worthwhile making the case, you know, and going back to some of these countries and doing urban versus rural. But I can tell you unambiguously that the secular improvement, like urban populations were better off 20 years ago like they are now, but rural populations have also seen dramatic improvements in their health indicators. So I don't think this is... Um, a story, it is a story in part of movements of populations and accessibility, but I don't think this is a story of only rural populations are getting better off and, and benefiting from kind of the, the uh, investments in, in public infrastructure and uh, increases in their um, general level of well-being. Um, Finn, I think your question, uh, or well, firstly, uh, I stand corrected on, on the first point. Um, I did not, okay, so let me leave it at that. Uh, in terms of the wider papers, uh, my um, commendation to wider in general for being one of the few institutions uh, to have a very broad perspective in, in, in looking at these questions. Uh, and your second question, though, is, is, is actually a really important I th or comment is an important one in my mind. I mean, I think one of the unheralded, unheralded um, and amazing success stories in development is the improvements in health indicators. And to the extent that you're suggesting that, you know, donors or, or government officials kind of are um, expressing a sense of frustration that this that, that that success is not fully recognized or internalized by donors and others. Um, I think it's an important issue, but it's also an important economic issue. And I remember uh, sitting and having probably a quite similar conversation with, with uh, who was the Minister of Finance in Ghana several years ago, and he was complaining about them being uh, criticized by the bank for a lack of improvement in their poverty numbers. For a long period of time, Ghana's poverty numbers, despite kind of it was one of the poster children for economic growth and good governance and so forth, um, were quite intractable, the, ec the income poverty numbers. And then he said to me, and, and you know, I'm not sure, the sales pitch may have been overstated, but he said, but look at our health indicators. They've improved dramatically. And that's because we've improved our tax systems. That's because we measure income and consumption after taxes. You know, he gave a whole bunch of reasons, but he said, but the primary reason is we're investing, taking the money, taking the income as much as we can through taxation and other means, and investing in health. So it's not showing this big decline in income poverty, but we're seeing a big decline in other measures, or a big improvement in other measures of well-being. And he was saying that out of a sense of frustration. So, you know, it seems to me that at the policy level, I think one clear lesson is that the, whether it's the donor community or governments, they've done a great job in terms of improving health, and they've done an almost equally job and good job in terms of improving education outcomes. While whether donors and, um, and policy dialogue has been equally effective, you know, in terms of improving uh, GDP growth, for example, or even addressing income inequality is less clear to me. Um, but I think unambiguously in terms of the social service side, the news is, is really pretty impressive and uh, not sufficiently well appreciated, even in countries where their economic indicators have lagged, uh, you know, quite significantly. Uh, I, I, I have two quick questions. One to Miguel. I mean, the, your results, besides the objection made by Francois, your results seem to be hinging very much for the 2008-2014 period on this sort of uh, stabilization and then slight decline on the China inequality 
data. And the question is, it, is this uh, government statistics or are they independent service? Because when somebody told me that, well, you know, the Chinese, they started getting tired of being told that uh, they are growing a lot, but they are very unequal, so the Central Statistical Office was, received orders to improve the results. <laughs> Rather than the, so that, I mean, I don't know if there are other sources which do confirm that trend. Now, the second point is uh, for uh, David. Uh, I think that um, there is the Bourguignon story, which is, uh, there was a famous book in the past called The Poor Have to Wait. So first the services are delivered to the uh, urban people, then to the richer people in the rural areas or the more neighboring areas. and. And so that may be, uh, this is Francois' explanation. Now the second one is the one that uh, uh, Finn and yourself have provided, which is, well, much more money has gone into that. And that, I, I agree with you, is, uh, is a wonderful thing. A third explanation could be that uh, the health technologies um, have improved. I mean, I spent uh, 14 years working for UNICEF, and I remember that basically Jim Grant's uh, Gobi FFF revolution So. So the, the, the same dollars uh, spent on uh, vaccinations basically had a much bigger impact on, uh, than a dollar spent on standard, standard care. So I don't know whether you are able to capture that, but I agree with you that these are impressive numbers. So why don't we uh, take responses sort of question by question now. Um, so I guess the first question was again for Rahul. Is that right? No? Uh, Miguel? <laughs> Uh, yes, um, thank you, Andrea. Yes, um, the data is from the NBS, so this is the official data from China. Um, China updated the last estimates uh, from 2003 to 2013. Um, and what they, they did is not only to harmonize this time series or this period, but also they tried to adjust um, as well with national accounts to impute incomes from the, um, the very rich, so the end of the income distribution. So um, um, they, they, uh, they said that, that they did that. And uh, when I was in China last week, they said, uh, they explained me that they have done that for that particular period. So whether is, um, the data is um, <laughs> adjusted or not, I don't know. But uh, this is official data, this is official data. Can I make a quick comment, just that um, my colleague Wenjie Zhang, sorry, my colleague Wenjie Zhang, she's also uh, been doing some work on China and noticed the same trend with the peak in inequality in 2009 using the UTIP UNIDO data. So if you look into that, you'll see that as well. I think... Uh, we generally agree. And just one clarification is I think it's less technological fixes in the sense that we often think about technology and more in terms of the ability to deliver uh, services in an efficacious manner, uh, basically creating a creation of, of kind of institutions at the local level that are able to to provide these low-cost technologies. So I don't think it's been technological advances. The one clear exception is a problem that didn't exist 20 or 30 years ago is HIV, where, where that miracle is a technological miracle of drugs, but that's, that's the one clear exception. Everything else has been new, basically focused on delivery and, uh, and outreach and, and uh, dissemination of existing technologies. Thanks. Uh, okay, any more questions? There's one back here. Right back there. On the right-hand side. <laughs> right, thanks. Um, I'd like to go back to the very first presentation, uh, Beatrice. Um, you said in, your, in the final PowerPoint uh, the literature on inequality measurement is very messy. Um, perhaps I'd like to offer a slightly more positive interpretation of what you were showing because you showed some country cases where uh, it really was messy because the, you had few observations, short time series and very contradictory uh, trend analysis. But you had some other um, country cases uh, where the picture was much clearer, although 
you had longer time series. I think you pointed out the UK um, uh, as, as a case in point where you have long time series and where you have four, five, six data sets that shows the same trend lines. So once you have that, um, you can, and you have trend lines that would either show uh, for four or five or six data sets um, decline and then a bottoming out and then an increase or, the vice, or, or vice versa, then you can be pretty sure um, that there's something there. Um, if there's consistency between the trend lines of quite a few uh, observations. Um, and even if those observations are on fairly shorter timelines, and that's the China example, um, it looks like there's, you had four or five observations that said uh, increasing inequality from sometime in the early 1990s and then a peak around 2008, 2009 and, and then a decline. Um, that gives me quite a lot of confidence in those observations. Um, and um, um, Miguel, I don't think you should be surprised that there was the peak in around 2008, 2009. I would say um, a lot of literature would actually say that once you've had uh, that long period of growth, a very high level of, of GDP growth in China, and an increase in inequality over a period of 15 years, it's not surprising at all that you then get a peak and the uh, inequality starts to, to decline uh, according to those uh, measurement criteria that was, was used. Thanks. Okay, Beatrice, do you want to comment? Yes, thank you. Um, about your comment, one thing I just wanted, I, I agree with you that it's true for some countries, um, you do have enough data that gives you some confidence in um, the measures, but I didn't show a lot of the countries where it's much more messy, such as the sub-Saharan African cases where there's just a lot of missing data and um, it's incongruent. So, thanks. Well, thanks. I think you're right. I mean, um, of course, um, we may expect that uh, growth has an effect on, on, on the long-term uh, decline in inequality, but I think the story is not only that. So, um, because precisely we observe this this drop after the crisis. So, yes, growth has an effect, obviously, but I don't think it's the only uh, part of the answer. So, yeah. Okay, we have time for uh, just one more question. At least one of our speakers has to leave uh, exactly at 3.30 for transportation reasons, so it's to you. No, ju just a brief observation for what it may be worth why we were raising the issue of the difference between uh, consumption and uh, income inequality um, is because from practical experience, for instance, in South Africa recently, um, an announcement was made that um, consumption inequality had declined and so inequality had declined. But when uh, the information was interrogated further, it was established that, in fact, it is consumption inequality, whilst in income inequality had not declined. And amongst other reasons for this, if you were to look at uh, mine workers, for instance, many of them are neck deep in debt. So their income is low, and they go to micro lenders simply to, 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 to support their, their consumption. So the difference between the two, I think it's an issue that needs uh, clarification as the data mining and, and, and analysis is completed. Thanks. Okay, let's uh, just take that as a comment, and then there appears to be one very urgent matter that has to be raised here, so would you please... Uh uh, have the final word there. Yeah, I'll just ask, wondering, because I've been raising my hand from the very first round. Thank you for finally giving me the last word. Um, I have a couple of questions for David. And uh, First is that uh, I tend to concur with my friend who says it might not be a very dramatic thing, but for a different reason. If you look at... Um, the relationship with the, 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 the growth incident curves for income, 
uh, well the poor benefit but uh, lower than what the rich benefit but when you translate that to, to health it's normal that the, 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 the rich uh, the, the poor will appear to benefit more than the rich uh, probably because the, the, uh, with income the rich can increasingly get more income or benefit more from growth but when you come to health something like height for example there's a limit no matter how much income how, how much resources you have you cannot just uh, the relationship cannot be linear or to, to perpetuity. There's a cut-off point. So it could ra rather be a situation where it is the translation of, uh, well, the uh, relatively little much that the poor benefit is translated to that level of health, but the rich have already reached their saturation point in terms of height, and you don't expect much. The second question is, suppose your point is the case that there's actually a bias benefit to, uh, on the side of the poor. Who does the credit go to? Is it government policies? Is it, uh, is it that governments are really being very effective in distributing their tax revenue in terms of proper services? Uh, I'm asking this question if you take South Africa, for example, or maybe Brazil, uh, where you, have, you might have dual system of uh, health and also education. I don't know. I didn't see you present those cases, but I don't know what you will find out of uh, situations like that. But lastly and quickly, let me uh, ask a question to uh, La, is it Rahul. Uh, uh, I don't know to what extent your assumption, when you, you had your, your estimated uh, income and expenditure shares, they didn't up, add up to 100, and you assumed that that uh, shortfall was equally distributed. But when I look at uh, what possibly might be driving the regressions, I don't think that the relationship between income and expenditure for the rich will be the same like that of the poor. You might want to think that uh, maybe there will be bigger error for the rich than the poor. Thank you very much. And David, do you want to respond quickly? So your, your, point, your first point is well taken. In fact, uh, certain measures of health inequality will tend to be driven largely, uh, unlike income equality, by the shape of the left-hand tail of the distribution because there is some limit to how tall you can get or how long you can live. Um, I think many of the countries in the sample, particularly in Africa, it's not really a big issue yet because infant mortality rates are still, you know, 80, 90, 100. So even at the upper end of the distribution, the probabilities of dying are still pretty high. Um, so, but your point is generally well taken, but in one sense it says that maybe we should worry more about health inequality because it's more sensitive to what's happening at the lower end of the income distribution or the health distribution rather than the upper tails, which do we really want to worry too much about how much money Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have. Um, the second, and how that drives inequality numbers. The uh, second point in terms of who, uh, I'll, I'll leave it to you and the World Bank and ministers to have that discussion and figure out who should get the blame or the uh, uh, the praise for I, I really could not answer that question in a, in a uh, informed way but it, it's worth I'm not sure that you can apportion uh, the success you know decompose the success into the different players in the game and Rahul um, so um it, just a difference. Uh, it's not equally done, but equiproportionally. So the rich tend to get higher. So, but the four percentage gap, each of the per uh, quintile will get four percent. So, in absolute terms, the share of the rich would increase or uh, decrease uh, more. Okay. Um, I'll just make one uh, quick comment. Um, uh, to me, one of the most interesting things uh, that we've heard about in the conference is the uh, decrease in inequality that's uh, been seen in uh, Brazil recently, and uh, now we're hearing about it in China as well. I think if uh, Mr. Heckscher or Mr. Olin were here, uh, they would say, well, that's what they predicted, and took a little while for uh, the results of globalization to uh, 
take the, the form that uh, they would have predicted, but evidently they have. So I'm sure that they're happy wherever they are. Okay, thanks very much to uh, all the speakers and to the um, uh, group here today. It's been a really worthwhile discussion. And let's thank the speakers again. Thank you.